Okay, welcome everybody to our first public talk of the fall 2010 academic season. My name is Lisa Sieverts. I teach the project management class and also the tech fluency class. And it was under the auspices of technical fluency that I thought of bringing our speaker, John Udell, in. He's going to come in and talk to our class afterwards to get into some of the uh, technical and usability details. But I also thought it would be great to have more of a general talk here after conversing with John. And he's been working on some very interesting things for the past few years. And he's ready to start spreading the word about what he's been thinking about. So you guys are kind of the guinea pigs for getting these concepts out there. Um, John's an author, an information architect, a software developer, and a new media innovator since before we understood what new media was all about. Uh, he wrote a book in 1999, this is like prehistoric times from the internet perspective, called Practical Internet Groupware, which helped to lay the foundation for what we now call social software. Um, he worked at Lotus, he served as Byte Magazine's executive editor, um, and since January of 07, he's been consulting, working for Microsoft, they let him live in Keene, which I think tells you about what a visionary he is, that Microsoft just wants to have access to his thinking. Please join me in welcoming John Udell. Well, thanks, Lisa. Thanks for coming, folks. So I'm going to talk about a couple of projects that I've been kicking around for, in some cases, almost 10 years now related to how we can connect the internet back into the local community. And one of them is about libraries, and one of them is about public events. Um, and so both of those things are projects that could, they are being used by people all around the world, and they could be applied here in Brattleboro. So if somebody is interested in hooking the Brattleboro library into this thing I'll show you, or hooking the you know events information system in Brattleboro into this, then I'm happy to talk to you guys about that and work with you on it. Uh, but what I want to really focus on is the underlying principles that have, first of all, enabled me to figure out how to do these things in a way that isn't specific to any particular tool or technology or service or application. It's just a way of thinking about what the internet really is and how we can actually use it if we really understand what it is. And that's, that's what I'm trying to sort of draw out in, in uh, this talk, which is, uh, I haven't done this before, so we'll see how it goes. <laughs> um, so the library project, it, I call it Library Lookup. And it started um, actually back in 2002. I was uh, at Amazon, and I was about to press the Buy button on a book. And I remembered that at the Keene Public Library, there's a lookup system on the web. There was even back then. And I thought, you know, why do I never use that? And uh, I went and looked up the book that I was about to buy and found that it was in the library and it was available. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And then I, I realized that it would be fairly straightforward to make a connection between this Amazon page for a book and the public library. So uh, one observation is that the Amazon URL for a book contains the ISBN. Um, and uh, that's actually also how you look up the book in the, in the library. So uh, the other observation was, well, I could make a bookmarklet. And it could look at the ISBN of the Amazon page that I'm on and um, look it up in the library. Right? So I did that. And I still think it's pretty cool. Right? I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty cool in a lot of ways. Uh, and so apart from presenting people with the notion, there's this cool bookmarklet that you should have uh, so that you could do this neat trick, what are, the, what are the principles that enable this to happen and enable a lot of other things like this to happen? So that, you know, to bring it back to the local context, I mean, what I really cared about was I wanted to create an excuse for me to take a walk down to the library and also 
being cheap. You know, I don't want, I don't have to buy a book that that um, I could I could I could get for free from the library. But it was really about, you know, we spent all this time on the internet. Um, you know, how can we link things back into the local community in ways that'll generate foot traffic, in ways that'll make me uh, see my friends when I walk downtown, and maybe I'll stop into the coffee shop and run into Andreas, right? So, you know, I mean, I'm always thinking about how we sort of make these connections. But, the, you know, the, the sort of those principles underneath of that um, are, are what I really want to talk about. So, uh, first of all, there's this idea of resource identifiers, right? Or URLs, as we know them, right? And, and this is a really profound and deep concept that we, we work with them every day. We work with URLs every day. But we don't really... I think even now fully understand the properties of these things. A friend of mine gave a talk, I don't know, 12 or 13 years ago. And uh, he just put this URL up on this, his one slide, and I put, a, put up a URL. It was the URL of a FedEx package. It was right when FedEx had just uh, made it possible to track packages on the internet. And he just put the URL up, and he was looking at it, and he said, you know, this is amazing. Every FedEx package has its own home page on the internet. You know, Think about that. It's just totally amazing. And, and, and we really still, I think, have not fully internalized. What does it mean, right, that everything can have a resource identifier, can have this name that's globally unique, right, and that lives out in the cloud in a way that other things can get connected to, right? I mean, there are just infinite possibilities here. So, so in this case, one of those resources is, uh, is the URL on the Amazon site. And another one of those resources is a corresponding URL. And this is how you search the Keene Public Library for that same book. Right? So um, you know, first, just the observation. Right? This thing, as it exists on Amazon, has a global, a global resource identifier. Right? And that's a meaningful thing. It associates to the book. And so does this other thing. Um, so the principle of structure in data, um, well, that URL, yeah, it's an address to something. But also, if I look at it, it's actually made up of pieces. And those pieces have a regular structure. Right? And I can actually I can see that I would be able to identify the URL of any book on an Amazon page, not just that particular book, by just observing that there's this pattern. And I can match part of the pattern, and I can match another part of the pattern. And I've got the, the ISBN. Right? Um, and then I can do kind of this little URL arithmetic, right? So if I have x is the Amazon URL up to the ISBN, and y is how you search for that same thing on Keen State, then you can just make that transformation, right? Just like, just like algebra. Substitute x for y, and you're looking up the book in someplace else. Right? Well, and again, there are whole classes of things that work this way. And this is really the point, right? This is, you know, this is to get you to think broadly about what is possible. Um, so query, right? So, so this is a search. It's not just a way of looking up this one particular book, right? I can substitute any ISBN, and I can look up any book. So it'll work for any book. And um, you know, this is uh, the abstraction of it, right? It'll search any book. Or I can substitute, well, if you think about it, there are lots of different libraries out there. And they use a number of different lookup systems. But within each, within each family of systems, there's a pattern that's how you look up a book in that library. Right? And then there are many systems, and they each have their own patterns. So the, you know, sort of the generalization of that was, was this. Right? So I, I looked around, and I wound up talking to lots of librarians around the, the world. Actually, and, and what it turns out is that there are, I don't know, 20 or 30 what they're called OPAC systems, online public access catalogs, right? So Keen uses one called Innovative, and there are you know, hundreds and hundreds of libraries that use the same library, as, same library system as Keen does. So if I wanted to make it possible for anybody at any library that was using the Innovative system, I just had to figure out what was the pattern that would look up a book, right? And then they could swap in their own domain name, right? So instead of keen.edu and the rest of the URL, it would be someplace in Montclair, New Jersey, or someplace in, in Hawaii, right? So that, that, so that immediately opened it up to a whole set of libraries that used that system. And then over time, 
we found a number of other systems. And it was all the same deal, right? At the end of the day, there was some way of saying, you know, in this library system, this is the URL that looks up a book, right? If I can identify the piece of the URL that is invariant, right, then I can make it work for that library for any book, and anybody who uses that library can have this feature. Uh, so so um, time goes on, and you know, a couple of years ago, I, I, I did a refinement of this idea, right? So, I mean, it was kind of cool when you're on the Amazon page to be able to click and see if the book that you're looking at is in the library. But it would be much nicer to have a service that the library doesn't yet offer, right? The service of, I have books on a wish list, and I would like to know when a book that's on my wish list becomes available in the library. Well, tell me, so I can go and get it, right? So uh, the way this thing works is that you can tell the service a couple of different ways how you track your books, right? So it, it, currently, you can tell it, this is my Amazon wish list, right? Here's a list of books on Amazon that I'm interested in. If any of those books shows up at my library, I'd like to be notified, right? But you wouldn't have to use Amazon. You could use another, you could really use any service that keeps a list of books somewhere in the cloud with a URL with an address associated to that list. That's the list of things that you care about, right? So another way of doing it is uh, Library Thing, which is a, a popular service for people that like to talk about books, collect books, keep track of books. And so lots of people on Library Thing have their own lists of the books that they care about, and they have wish lists there too. Right? So what, what are the principles of this thing? Um, there's this idea of public data. Right? There's this idea that uh, if I have a list of books that I care about, that's data. And I can publish that data at some URL, in this case, the URL to the Amazon wish list. And by doing that, I enable some cooperating service on the internet to, with my permission, use that information. So the cooperating service in this case is the service that looks up the books on my Amazon wish list every day, then goes to the library and checks if they're available and emails me if they are. Right. So I've published some data online. Um, and, uh, but there are lots of other ways, right? So that is my list of books on library thing. And you can imagine doing the same thing with Barnes & Noble. You can imagine doing the same thing in really any number of ways, right? You could do this potentially with a list of social bookmarks like on Delicious, right? It wouldn't really matter where you did it, right? It would only matter that what you had done was made a list of things, published the address of that list someplace on the internet, um, published the list in a form that was machine readable, so it could be processed by a computer or a, an application or a, or a web service, and then communicated that address to somebody else. Um, uh, Right, so we talked about web services, right? So in the background here, um, you just want to sort of bear in mind that, that all of these websites now that you think of as being accessible when you go and visit them and interact with them in your browser are all equally accessible from another perspective that you don't usually see, right? And that's the web services perspective, right? So you may have heard the phrase API, which is application programming interface, right? All Websites effectively now, all major uh, websites and lots of minor ones too, do this. So if I want to be able to work with that website from a programmatic perspective, right? I want to, you know, not go visit it and interact with it, but I want to say, um, behind the scenes, when you are contacted by this other service that wants access to my list of books, give it access to those books so it can do this other thing for me, right? So what you're doing really is, well, we'll, we'll get to that, right? So. Um, so there are you know, what I could call explicit web services. And uh, those are cases where there is a programming interface to the website. Right? And this is true for many, including Barnes & Noble and Amazon. Where there isn't one, and it's just something to, to realize, so library thing doesn't actually formally provide a web service. And so even when a site doesn't do that, though, it's possible, it's technically possible, to go in and, from a software perspective, 
automate the things that the person would be doing in a web browser to get information out of the website. So in the case of library thing, um, it would be easier if they provided an API that you could just get the list out of them. But since they don't, it's still possible actually to write software that goes in and pretends to be a human being using a browser and does what a human being would do to go to the place in the website where the list is, take the page of HTML and figure out that inside of it contains data and, and use the data. Right? So that's kind of an implicit web service. And there's actually uh, a lot of that going on too. So then there's this idea of indirection. right? So uh, a lot of times you'll join some service or application and it will say, okay, start by giving me all of this information. Right? So you could imagine this book lookup service might say, so first you have to register with me. Then you have to give me all your book information. Make, make, make the list of books in me, in this web service that I am offering to you, so that I can give you the service of looking the books up. Right? But what you'd really like to do is say, well, you know, I'm going to give you the address of a list that I already have, which is over there, or over there, or wherever it is. Right? So you'd like to point to the list. You would like to not have to make another copy of the list and transmit it. Right? So you know, indirectly, use my Amazon wish list or use my library thing wish list. Um, and then there's just this idea of um, composition of services. Right? So this is another little sort of equation. Right? I have a service over here on Amazon, and it is the service of me, you know, that enables me to keep track of a list of books that I say I'm interested in, right? and then provides that list at some URL. Over here, I have another service, and this service says, I know how, given the ISBN for some book, to look it up in some library. Right? So what the service that I created here does is it mashes up these other two services. Right? So it creates a new service which looks up books on my wish list in my library. Right? So this, this uh, I mean, you probably hear the term mashup a lot. Um, and uh, it gets used in a variety of ways. But I mean, what's, what's underlying that, that kind of buzz phrase right now is this idea of composition. And it's a really powerful, fundamental idea um, you know, that increasingly, what we're seeing when we look out in the world of the internet are services that exist and you know, where formerly we would interact with them directly one to one. Um, increasingly, they start to have relationships with one another explicitly. And even when they don't, you can create those relationships if they were only implicit. Right? So what, what I actually am uh, doing with the library lookup thing is I'm creating a relationship that was implicit between Amazon and my library. Right? And the implicit link was the ISBN. Right? And by making that explicit, by saying I'm going to take the ISBN out of Amazon's URL and put it into the library's URL, I've created a new service um, without really writing any software. Right? I mean, this, this part here involved a little bit of software in the back end. But the first thing that I showed you, the bookmarklet that just gets the ISBN and sticks it into the library lookup, was one line of JavaScript. Right? I mean, it's, 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 so this is, this is the thing, right? It, a lot of this stuff doesn't require much or necessarily even any programming. If you have the state of mind and the attitude and the understanding that you're in this world of services, that these services have ways of connecting to one another, and you can figure out how to exploit that. So, so that's the library example. And uh, so you might be thinking, well, OK, you know, this is, um, this is like all this computer science stuff, right? I mean, this is terminology from computer science, indirection and abstraction and composition and, and resource identifiers, right? Um, and uh, you know, it is, right? But so you might well ask, you should ask, you should challenge me. I am not a geek. Why do I care about this stuff, right? I mean, you know, some, maybe most of you are in a technical curriculum. But you know, I would invite you to pretend that you're not. Right? And, and, and think about your, your normal, your civilian friends, you know, your non-geek friends. Because right? this, is, this is where we really need to get to, is you know, we've got to get out of the mindset of, oh, I'm a geek, and, you know, and I know stuff that nobody else knows, and it's, it's geeky, and it's cool. Right? Well, that's fine up to a point, but actually it's not fine, because it just doesn't go any farther. Right? And, and there's much more that needs to happen in the world. And so um, one of the ideas uh, that's, that's afoot so this is uh, 
This, this woman is, is Jeanette Wing. And at the time that she wrote this article, she was the head of computer science at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, she's now with the National Science Foundation. She wrote this article that uh, galvanized a lot of people's thinking, including mine. And, and what she's basically saying is um, that, well, this is, this is it in a nutshell, right? She's saying there's a fourth R, right? We've got reading, writing, arithmetic, and then there's this other thing, this other mental toolkit, this other intellectual discipline um, that is universally applicable, right? It's something everybody needs to know on some level and is on the same footing as reading, writing, and arithmetic. She calls it computational thinking. I actually worry about that term because I think it's alienating, right? It, it brings people back into that computer science mindset, oh, this is math, computer science geek stuff, right? And so uh, you know, I'm trying to figure out what is a, a broader way to to describe that, and I don't really know the answer. But when I go to education conferences and I hear people talking about, well, we've got to teach, you know, 21st century skills, you know, or systems thinking, or uh, digital literacy, or, or whatever, right? Uh, I, I think two things, right? I think one that that's actually this, number one, and number two, I don't think any of us has bothered to really formulate what are the principles, right? I mean, what are the you know, commutative and associative laws of arithmetic in the domain of, of networked information systems, right? So I think we need to figure out what those are. We need to write them down, and we need to teach them, and, and explicitly not just teach them to people on technical tracks, right? It's mo actually more important. And people, the technical people are going to get it eventually, right? But everybody else isn't necessarily going to get this stuff. In fact, most people won't. And um, it's, actually, it's actually quite important. So. Um, yeah, so this is just, so one of the things I do is I have a, an audio show on the internet um, called uh, Interviews with Innovators. It's at a place called IT Conversations. And uh, I, I talk to lots of people about things. And anyway, just by way of background, I've got uh, an interview with Jeanette and a follow-up interview with Joan Peckham, who uh, works for Jeanette at the National Science Foundation. And we're kind of, uh, in both of those, we're talking about these ideas of, you know, what what is this stuff? What would we call it? How would we teach it? Right. So, I'm just uh, I, I am interested in engaging with people who are interested in that and thinking about how to teach it. So, so the second major case study here is this uh, public events thing that I've been working on. Um, it's called the Elm City Project because Keene's tagline is the Elm City. And it started in Keene, but like a lot of these things, I, I do I sort of I sort of prototype them in Keene. As a, as a model for something that could be rolled out in lots of other places. And it winds up getting rolled out to lots of other places, but not used in Keene, because you know, <laughs> the prophet is without honor in his own land. <laughs> but um, but uh, anyway, so, so what is this thing, right? So this is today in Keene, uh, and it's events that are you know, collated by, by time for that date that come from uh, five different kinds of sources, right? So four of the sources are public web services that you could go to, you could register, become a user, say I live in Keene or Brattleboro or wherever, and post events in, right? So uh, one of them is called Eventful, one of them is called Upcoming, one of them is called Eventbrite, and one of them is called Facebook, actually. So Facebook just recently uh, became a thing that you can use in this more public way. So in, in all of those cases, the idea is you can go to this website and you can say, um, you know, I, I am Lisa and uh, we're having this talk at noon at the Marlboro Graduate School. Um, and anyone who was joined to that service would find out about it, right? So, um, well, you can kind of see the problem, right? So now Lisa needs to think about, well, let me, does that mean I have to go to, you know, eventful and upcoming and, you know, everywhere else? and put copies of everything that I want to publicize into all of these places. Right? So that's, that's problem number one. Um, you know, but problem number two is that if you're Lisa, you probably already have your own calendar. Right? You might actually have your own personal, let's say, Google calendar. And you might have another instance of it or some other, you, know, you could use Outlook, you could use any, pretty much any calendar program um, to publish data about events to the internet. Right? And I guess I guess this is the part that hasn't really sunk in for a lot of people yet. So people think about calendars as a way of managing your personal information. 
right? And then if you're maybe using a cloud-based calendar, you kind of realize, oh, well, you know, my information's out in the cloud and I can actually share it with other people, right? Well, you can actually do more than that. You could, you could publish your calendar information in a way that was available to the whole community. So the, the fifth major source of stuff in here is uh, calendar feeds that come directly from people's own calendar software that have published their lists of events to the internet at an address that a service can come and get. So, um, so the Elm City project uses the APIs of you know, eventful up, upcoming event right on Facebook to get their information, but then it, go, it goes to a list of other things. And so here, uh, uh, you know, there's one from the Keene Public Library. This is uh, the UNH co-op extension, uh, right? So it's a mixture of stuff, right? Stuff that comes from people's own calendars and stuff that comes from these other services. And they get joined together. Uh, and so this is, I, I just made a little map of where it's being used. Um, so these are, so these are what I call hubs, right? So, so to start a hub, if you wanted to start a hub for Brattleboro, um, it's pretty straightforward, actually. You, just, you literally just make a couple of delicious bookmarks that tell where you are and how you want your stuff to be aggregated. And then you tell me about that, and, and the service will go do it, right? So um, you know, it's being used uh, in, in a variety of places, but it's not being used very well yet. Uh, because what happens is, People, so if you, if you start up a hub for your town, uh, I call you a curator, right? You're the curator for the Brattleboro hub, or you're the curator for the music in Brattleboro hub, right? Or, you know, I mean, it could be, you can, you can organize this thing in any way you want, right? And, uh, and you could do it by topic as well. So it doesn't have to be a geographic location. It could be, I'm the curator for uh, contra dancing, uh, you know, in, in some region like New England or whatever, right? So, um, so the principles, are, they go like this, right? So first of all, this idea of, again, resource identifiers, right? So somebody's, um, in that case, I think it's a uh, cold fusion content management system. So, so, this, so I should explain that the, the standard, the internet standard for calendar information is called iCalendar. Uh, and it's, it's been around for 10 years. It's, it's, it's very common. Um, you know, if you use Outlook, if you use Apple iCal, if you use Google Calendar, uh, or if you use a content manage one of a number of content management systems that makes web pages available, you know, there's also the possibility of getting this structured data out the back in this format that's called iCalendar. So these are iCalendar URLs, um, you know, and they identify resources, which are lists of things, right? So same idea, right? Same idea as the wish list from the book example, right? You know, I want to I want to take this list and I want to put it out at some address that I can identify as being unique and canonical for that set of resources, right? And then I want to convey that address to some service that can make some use of it, right? Um, so this idea of data structure is just to say that if you were to open up an iCalendar file, it's it's such an old standard that it's actually it doesn't even if you're familiar with this kind of thing, it doesn't even use XML. Right? It's just one of these old-fashioned internet, you know, name of the property colon value, right? And this is how iCalendar, if you, you know, export a calendar file out of your, you know, Apple uh, iCal or you look inside of a Google thing, this is all it is. This is all it is, right? It's just saying, you know, DT start, date and time start, you know, 2010, 10, 06, 11, 30, blah, 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 you know. Um, but, but this is um, a really, really hard thing for people to understand, I have found. I have found, well, we'll get into it, but, but, but this, the, 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 the failure for us to educate people about what is the difference between a computer file that contains data which is structured in this sense and can be operated on automatically by a computer or a software program versus you know, a PDF file which is just intended for a person to read and print. You know, the, the, there's a huge disconnect uh, going on between those two things. So then, then there's this, uh, this idea of transformation, right? So given this data, um, you know, there's a, a number of different ways that we can represent it, right? So uh, one of the ways is that this is, so this on the top here is, is what it kind of looks like if you're using the calendar application, right? So now, the, you know, the computer has rendered this thing and you have these links that you can click on and you can have agenda views and month views. And, you know, so, the, the, so it's been transferred the data 
has been transformed into a way that is useful for a person to interact with or maybe just printed it out, right? So on the bottom, you know, it's like, here, just print this and stick it on your refrigerator, right? It's just, it's just, now it's just a picture of information. It's just a string of characters for a person to read. But it doesn't have any, any of this meaning. So um, the idea that that, that that transformation is possible is also something that is really not appreciated uh, at all, right? So, I, I, so, so we'll, we'll get into that too. <laughs> Um, and, 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 but this is really the, the, the tough, toughest nut to crack. For me, communicating to other people what this is about. Right? So since I've been doing this, um, and I, I run the Hub for Keen, um, I get a lot of emails from people that say, I'm you know, having this event. Could you put this event on your calendar? And, uh, or could you put it in your database? And I say, there is no database. It's like in the Matrix, right? There is no spoon. <laughs> there is no spoon. And it, because, because this, is, this is all that the service does is it takes information from these sources, right? these public services, and from these sources, right? flows it together, and flows it back out. Right? So um, well, where would it flow back out to? You know, it could flow back out to the Broadway Reformer, um, the Keen Sentinel, you know, there's I Brattleboro. There's any number of sort of public aggregations where this stuff could go, right? But it could also go to all of these things, right? So these things, these are your personal calendars, right? They show up on both ends of this diagram because from this context, you're a publisher of data, and in this context, you're a receiver of the data, right? And it's it's relevant in both places, you know. So uh, if uh, you know, the school publishes an iCalendar feed, right, that runs through the hub, and I am a parent who has a kid with soccer games, and I need to keep track of those soccer games relative to the other public stuff that's going on, and my own personal stuff, right? Well, you know, because there's a standard involved, I can take the stuff, actually, I should have drawn an arrow directly here, right, because if you, if you publish, if the school publishes one of these things, right, you know, the hub can come along and it can merge that with all this other stuff for all of these downstream sources. But yeah, I really should have put, you know, but this can happen directly, right? If, if the school had an iCalendar feed, I would be able to take the soccer game and stick it on my personal calendar where it belongs, right? Um, this, this concept of syndication is, I find, very difficult for people. Um, and I, I, I partly blame technologists and the technical media, of which I used to be a member. Right? So it's kind of our fault in some ways. Because I think that, that we did a disservice by being so fascinated with what's new and cool and hot this week that we've pretended that there are no common principles and there is no continuity going on here. So, I mean, to give you one example, right? Syndication, or another way of saying it is, it's the, the, the pub-sub, the publish-subscribe pattern, right? It's, it's a general pattern for how information flows in networks, right? You publish to some place and then one or more other parties subscribe to that thing that you've published to. Right? Publish and subscribe. Well, what do you know that works that way? Have you ever heard of this before? Okay, but but you know, blogs work this way. Twitter works this way, right? That's you know, when you blog, right? You one of the things that comes out of your blog is this thing called an RSS feed. The RSS feed is data that a computer can use, can subscribe to, right? Merge with other things and aggregate and present, or an individual can come along with an RSS reader and subscribe, right? So you publish, somebody else subscribes, right? Twitter, it's actually the same thing. I mean, abstractly, it's the same thing, right? You know, you publish at some Twitter address, one or more other Twitter users can subscribe to your feed, and vice versa, right? You can subscribe to theirs, right? So it's like the same pattern underneath, and we don't really, uh, we don't really call that out for people. Um, so, case study. Right. <laughs> um, all right. So this is the, the, the page, obviously, for, for, for events at Marlborough College. 
And here's, uh, here's this thing right here, right? And um, my question is, where is the data, right? And by data, I mean, right, I can tell you, or I can write down that it's Saturday at 1130 at the Marlboro College Grad School, right? But this is part of that lack of an intuition about the structure of data, right, and the abilities of computers versus human beings to sort of intuit structure, right? Computers don't just know what that means, right? That's why when we looked at that iCalendar thing, it was like sort of spelled out, right? You know, 20, 10, you know, a very, a very prescribed pattern for how do you know that this is actually that date? How do you know that it is a date? Now you know which date, right? There are, you know, ways that things get written down that work for computers, but most ways that we write things down don't, right? So, so um, okay, well, the data is not on that web page, right? So what's on that web page, if we actually open it up, right? It says Saturday, October 9, 11.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. So, okay, you know, could a computer figure it out? Yeah, it could if it was operating in a restricted context, right? If it knew that that web page was in the Eastern time zone, right? And if it knew that it was supposed to be an events page, and it, you know, but even then, right, I mean, if you think about how many different ways the title and the time and date information could appear in random HTML, right? There's an infinite number of varieties. And the, and the fact is, you can't reliably extract this information, right? So the, so, so the page is publishing data for humans to read and print and put on their refrigerators, but it's not publishing data for, human, for, for systems, services, to take, combine with other stuff, right, and get into people's, let's say, electronic calendars, or onto, let's say, automatically, a community calendar. Um, right, and, oh, and same, right, that, so, that, so it's, the data is also not in the press release, right? So what the press release does is uh, it, it pushes out a notification to a variety of places, right? So it pushes out a notification to, I don't know, half a dozen newspapers, and I don't know who else, um, Chris had to send it to, right? And Chris has to do that every time, right? For every event, yeah. Chris has to go, okay, what's my list of contacts, right? And push, 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 right? Well, now, suppose Chris went and did that, and then we changed the time, which happens frequently, right? So now you're like, oh, geez, you know, who did I, like, now I have to revisit all those touch points and push, again, all the copies, right? Well, what I'm trying to point out here is that we can flip this model around, right? That what you want, actually, if you are the source of information, is you want to publish the information as data. Not only as data, you also, of course, you want to have your web page that people can come to and read and print and, if they want, post on the refrigerator as a reminder. But you want to publish the data in a way that other entities can subscribe to. Because then you could say to all of the newspapers that you have relationships with, well, here's our events feed. So if you subscribe to our events feed, which is a one-time transaction on your part, you know, then you're going to get this data. Right? Now, that doesn't mean that you also don't want to email them. You do, right? I mean, so you need to, you need to understand that there's, there's two things going on here, right? Or there was actually two things trying to happen. Only one is actually happening, right? One of the things that, that is actually happening is you are alerting somebody else <laughs> You know, you're sending a notification, right? That's what this press release is, a notification. This thing is happening, right? But it's also attempting to convey data. But it's not conveying data in any way that any of the recipients can use automatically, right? So, you know, if the Keen Sentinel had a calendar which actually had dates and times in it and it cared about the date and time matching up, which they don't, <laughs> long frustrating story, um, this, wouldn't, this wouldn't meet that need. Right. So an example, and, and by the way, I mean, not to pick on you guys, because like nobody does this. Almost nobody does this. Um, I did find an example that does. But, but so yeah, so this is how people talk about stuff, right? And this is how computers talk about that stuff. And you know, without anybody ever needing to know the details of, you know, because people write specifications for how this works, right? And, and that's a, an arcane discipline, right? Writing specifications for how do calendar programs unambiguously talk to other calendar programs. You know, that's what the whole internet is based on, right? There's a spec for HTTP. There's a spec for HTML, right? And people have devoted a huge amount of effort to this stuff so that things can work 
you know, invisibly to us, right? So, you know, nobody should ever need to know what are the details of the iCalendar format, right? But what everybody should know is there is such a thing as a format for calendars, right? And it, you know, it represents information, certain kinds of information in an unambiguous way, and, and we understand why it does that. And we therefore understand why we would want to publish information in that format when we want the information to flow around on networks and not have to be copied and pasted and you know, degrade and lose fidelity and, and everything else. Um, so this is actually one place that, uh, that does do this, right? So uh, events at Stanford, um, they have actually got it two ways, right? So they've got the RSS feed, uh, which, and we'll, we'll get to that too, is actually for people, not for machines in a certain sense, right? I mean, the RSS is basically a way of broadcasting headlines and blurbs out for people to see, oh, you know, yes, like, it would be like sending an email to somebody. It's a different way of sending a personal communication, right? But the iCal thing, that's, that's for software, that's for machines to be able to receive this information and operate on it automatically, right? So they actually do it both ways, right? And again, this idea of um, transformation, right? If you have the data, it's the same data. You can represent it as an RSS feed for one purpose. You can represent it as an iCalendar feed for another purpose. Um, and it doesn't cost you anything if you have if you've thought about this, you know, if you have a service or an application that does this, and a lot of them already do, it doesn't cost you anything to put it out in multiple formats, right? There's not, there's not a cost to that duplication. It's actually, it's actually a benefit. Um, so, so here is the Elm City Hub. So there is an Elm City Hub in Menlo Park, which is where Stanford is, right? And this is um, how the hub is showing the events for uh, Oh, this was like Friday, right? So, um, you know, what it's done is, well, we've seen this, right? So it's taking something from Eventful, something from Stanford's iCalendar feed, right? So this thing here, Stanford professors explore race and ethnicity, right? That thing is always coming from Stanford's iCalendar feed, right? Now, it can go any number of places, right? It can go onto somebody's personal calendar. It can go through a hub to, uh, a newspaper or a hyperlocal uh, website, right? Um, and uh, assuming that people, like what I always, what I always insist on is that there's a link here, right? Because ultimately, you know, everybody is the source for their own information. You want to be the authoritative source, right? So you basically want people to come back to you, right? You want people to click through to, uh, you know, wherever this thing is on the Stanford site to read the full description or just to check, like, did something change? Right, because it happens a lot. Or, as a matter of fact, though, that's not such a problem because, um, you know, if Stanford changes the time of this event, right, everybody who's downstream of that feed is going to get the change automatically. Right, they don't have to do anything different. Right, there's no, no other thing required. If they change it to 10 p.m. or 8 p.m. or something like that, and there are, you know five subscribers downstream, right? There's the Elm City Hub, and there's you know, two newspapers, and there's three people with their personal calendars. They're just gonna get the change, right? And so it's, it's really, it's extremely powerful to think about this pub-sub syndication model. Um, and again, this idea of multiple formats. So on the, on the hyper-local website uh, in Menlo, they don't actually use the HTML. Um, they put the, so, so the Elm City Hub takes all this stuff from different sources, right? puts it together into a list for some topic or location. And then it brings it back out in multiple formats, right? So we were looking at the HTML representation, but one of the formats that comes back out is iCalendar, right? And so one of the things that reads iCalendar is Google Calendar. So here on their hyperlocal website, they've chosen to use Google Calendar as a display widget, right? So they've subscribed it to the, feed, to the combined feed, which is coming out of this hub, um, and uh, there's that same stuff, right? So the stuff is coming from all of those different sources, right? Got merged together into the hub, and it can be shown here um, in a, a variety of ways, and it could be shown anywhere else, right? So anybody, uh, you know, there could be a university website that takes different views of this information, right? And it's pulling from it, and there could be, you know, a group of people who care about the topic that those professors are meeting about, and that event might come to them, you know, through another hub, but it would all track back to the same point, right? And if the information changed, it would all change for everybody. Um, uh, 
right? So, I have a hard time explaining this. Um, I have a hard time explaining this. It's, it's, and, and, I, and I am just really hard pressed to figure out what will work. But I think, I think that the problem is partly that what happens, what is possible online in terms of what are the properties of networks, what are the properties of information systems, what are the properties of pub sub networks, um, a lot of the stuff is non-intuitive because it doesn't relate to how things are in the real world. Right? In the real world, or the physical world, you know, I really do have to bring a copy of information to every place where I want it to go. Right? I mean, it's, yeah. Yeah, I understand. I, I think it's because the printing press governed our, our mental structure since its invention. And the fundamental properties of the web, like in 93, were read write, single copy, one copy for all. And this is all fundamental web properties that are diametrically opposed to the printing press. And our whole world's based on the printing press. It probably took 20 years to adjust, or 30. Yeah. And then the web and the, and the net are adjusting us to individual as web server, yep. with standardized, like, um, and Google finally realized that Microsoft Word, Office worked on the printing press principle, but the cloud works on the other principle, which is I share my document, I don't send an attachment. Right, right. So it's, it's a brain rewiring, which I hear is happening to, some, to, to kids. You know, it's, it's a, all the concepts around us in the world favor the press, it seems. The yeah, press. yeah. I, you know, I, I, I have this conversation all the time with people, and they say, oh, you know, it's a generational thing. And it will be solved when you know, the rest of us age out, and, 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 and the kids, the digitally native kids, um, will get this. You know. no, but, I but, you're right about the, the fourth R. It's like net, the net standard and the yeah. SD, uh, national educational technology yeah. standards for teachers, or tags, and RSS, and one copy. And yeah, there's a set of things that we, haven't, that we still don't teach, and, and, and people still don't get. right? Is is the is the the kind of thesis here? Um, oh, so I just want to point out that um, it, it isn't always all about the internet. So um, this is a little project I did with the cable TV channel, Channel Eight in um, Keene, Cheshire TV. Right? And so uh, what was happening? I think this isn't running anymore, but um, I thought it was cool. I convinced Lee to put a monitor up that was running a, a, a kind of a, a, a kiosk. Uh, scrolling feet, you know, view of the events for the day, right? So, it was, so, so everything that was coming through the hub was actually going to television, right? And when he had like a couple of spare minutes um, during the day, this thing would, would run. And it just, you know, just the point is that once you've got the information, um, it, it, it can go in a lot of places and, and, and turn up in a lot of contexts. Um, so, <laughs> so this is, so this is an interesting thing. Um, Especially considering the source, right? So this is, this is a website of the National Institute for Technology and Liberal Education. Right? And uh, they have an events page, and they have a feed on their events page. And I know why they do, right? Because a lot of people like me you know, beat them up for years and said, you must have an RSS feed. You must have an RSS feed. And they're like, I don't know what it is, but I must have it. So I will have it, right? So they have an RSS feed for their events, <laughs> right? And um, you know, the irony is that it's actually not a feed that's useful for the purposes I'm talking about. Right? It's a feed that pushes non-machine readable information to people who can read it, but it's not a feed that pushes data to calendar software that can use it. Right? And it's Nightly that's doing this. Right? So I mean, we have a problem. <laughs> we do. We, do. We, have, we have a problem, um, uh, a conceptual problem. Um, yeah, so this is, this is the RSS feed. And uh, I think, you know what? It doesn't even have, it's not only that the date, it's not only that the date and time were unstructured, they're not even in the thing. Uh, anyway, um, so, so from a kind of media perspective, right? This is, um, this is how it works now, almost universally, right? The, uh, uh, the newspaper, 
this is one of the Elm City hubs in Huntington, right? Um, send us your event, right? You know, go in and type out a copy of your information in a non-machine readable way and send it to us so we can pay somebody, because we have such vast resources as, as a newspaper in you know, the year 2010, right? To pay people to like, transcribe this data into, um, into our database. Or, or you know, the other favorite thing is, uh, well, just, log, just create an account, because you don't have enough of those. <laughs> create an account, log in. And, uh, and give us your stuff, right? And, and do that for every other place where you want it to go. Um, and uh, so, so this is, this is the, the model that um, I, you know, I'm trying to get people to think about, right? Like, yeah, you can still send us a copy if that's how you want to do it, right? But please consider publishing your data at a URL in the appropriate form for it to be processed automatically. And just tell us the URL. Right? And do that one time. Right? So you know, I, uh, I'm, I'm actually very. In fact, I think we lost the Battleboro reformer person, but I was kind of you know. I, I hope to get in touch with them, or you know, I, I, I've talked to, I've talked to newspapers ranging from the King Sentinel to the Guardian in the UK, and um, nobody wants to go first, <laughs> right? Basically, um, and I, but and it's also, I mean, you mentioned the print model. There's also this from a, I think from a newspaper perspective, there's this idea. Well, we. We publish. We don't subscribe. We have subscribers. We are publishers, right? And so they get, you know, now you see you know, newspapers have RSS feeds, right? You can get their headlines through RSS, right? You know, they don't yet begin to conceive of themselves as, um, I mean, if you think about it, right, the, the newspaper is one of the major attention hubs in a community, right? And what I'm inviting them to think about doing, and anyone else, you know, whether it's a hyper local website or whether it's, I don't know, the Chamber of Commerce, or I mean, there's lots, there's various entities within the community that are uh, that that are attention hubs, legitimately, right? There's one problem in dealing with the Brattleboro Reformer or something like this. This would eliminate their possibility to make mistakes, which is what they like to do. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, they um, they are they always got the stories from the people in the street. So one way of looking at it is it's yes. exactly what they do. Yes. It's just that they don't see an individual as a publisher of the information. They have to go get it. Yes. But what if it was just stream? What if it was they could just pick the stream? Yes. In a yes. Sense? Yeah. And, and and I think also, you know, there's just this terrible tendency to kind of polarize things. You know, so then, you know, well that would mean that we could never go out and get. No, it's like you can still do everything you were doing before, right? It's just that you have more resources at your disposal in a more reliable, more accurate way, which you presumably want. Well, sort of take some of the, <clears throat> some of the uh, editorial power away from them? No, I don't think so. Because, so, so here's the thing. In, in principle, it means, yes, why if all of this information is out there as you know, endpoints in the internet, and anybody can go and visit all of those same endpoints and collect all of the information, you know, aren't they going to take over for us? And I say, well, you know, if you are a legitimate attention hub within the community, then no, as long as you continue to be a legitimate attention hub, right? You will just benefit by having more and better information flowing through your attention hub, you know, which is now overlaid on this syndication hub, right? So that's the place I would argue that you want to be. Um, and if you're not going to get there anyway, then you're not going to get there and someone else is going to eat your lunch anyway, right? So, yeah, that, I mean, that's, that's my, yeah. Awesome new Someone hacks into a legitimate attention hub's user account and posts like, um, I love Sally, yeah. and it goes out to every feed in their calendar. Well, so that's, a, that's actually, uh, we probably, that's something that we can get into in the next hour, because there's a lot of detail in here about how to, how to trust or not trust different sources and, exactly. and things like that. But yeah, but, I mean, but, but just briefly, one of, the, one of the things that this means is that um, if you trust a source, right? So let's just say, let's just say that, uh, that the Keene Sentinel has a relationship with the Cheshire Medical Center, right? So in the real world, the person at the Sentinel knows the person at the Cheshire Medical Center, right? Tom Link actually is the PR guy, I think. So, uh, so they could say, well, all right, Tom, you know, we'd like to receive a feed from you because, well, we know you and we don't think you're going to spam us. And if you did, we could, you know, we could revoke um, our use of, of your feed. But, but, but so once we 
make that trust assignment. We don't have to worry about it, right? Everything that comes from that source, you know, we don't even feel like anyone has to look at it, right? As opposed to the stuff that comes in over the transom, you know, you actually have to, right? I mean, it was just, you know, a random person came up to the website and, and entered a thing. They actually have to look at that stuff. So, yeah. Right. or farming events, because I know on some websites that I go to all the time, there's actually what I love is it has a little icon, one for farmer events and one for you know, right. local food enthusiasts events. Right. And it's just, it's so refreshing. And that's the one thing I, I can see kind of uh, that I would run into. So I should explain um, that I do not intend the, st the HTML pages that you would see if you went to the hub and said, look at, look at you know, Honolulu or Keene or wherever. Right? I do not intend those to be destinations. Okay. Right? I, you know, really, those are just, you could call it a reference implementation. This is what an HTML representation of this data could look like. But what I you know, encourage people to do, it hasn't happened much yet, is you know, the data is available to you. Right? You can get it as XML. You can get it as iCalendar. I'm curious if there would be any kind of, it would have to be set up with tags or something. I mean, would that be something that would identify what yep. And there's all, all that is there, right? So, so uh, you know, the idea is that, yeah, I mean, the idea is that, uh, you know, a significant hyper-local website, you know, that really was in the business of figuring out, you know, what feeds do we trust, how do we categorize these things, you know, what's music, what's sports, art, blah, 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 right? The mechanism is all there, right? And, and, and I actually, you know, all, all I intend to do is provide the plumbing that would enable people to use uh, you know, whatever approaches that they that they want to. Yeah. I noticed in your in your blog you also had photos and I thought that was a really cool way. I don't know if it was certain blogs that you subscribe. Well that was just another so that was just another illustration of the same idea, right? So that was just, you know, I, I, that's I, I I'm not very active at Elm City info, but but it was kind of the same thing. Right? What what if you had a, a hyperlocal website that was entirely based on the principle of syndication? Right. So in that case, right, what it does is it goes to Flickr and just shows you what did people post that mentioned Keen right. on Flickr, right? Which is sort of just an interesting view of Flickr, right? The Keen view of Flickr. Um, you know, it's just another illustration of the same thing, right? And, and again, right, I mean, that, that principle could apply broadly. So Flickr's not the only place in the world where photos come from. It's not the only place where photos can be tagged, right? So a thing could merge multiple streams together, right, from lots of different sources. Yeah, yeah. And so John, just so you know, Jen, is at the Hannah Grimes Center, and one of the things she does there is manage the calendar and make sure that all of the re events relevant to the Hannah Grimes community of right. entrepreneurs and farmers. So that's actually kind of funny because, um, well, we talked about this, right? Yeah. 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 So here's what happened. This, this is interesting. Here's what happened. Um, a couple of years ago, when I was first starting to work on this, I, I talked to Neil Giartana, okay. right? Who, um, so, yeah, so, so Neil Giartana is a guy that builds websites on Drupal. He's done a bunch of them in Keene. And I got going on this, and um, I said, you know, Neil, is the Hannah Grimes site uh, uh, one of yours? He goes, yeah, it's on Drupal, yeah. So you have this HTML page with the calendar on it. You know, you could have an iCalendar feed, and then that, that calendar information could actually flow through the hub and go to people's personal calendars, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, oh, yeah, I didn't know about that. And he looked into it. He's like, yeah, there's just a configuration setting in Drupal. So he flipped the switch, and uh, then there was an iCalendar feed coming out of Hannah Grimes until Going away from it, so I explored um, Constant Contact, which has this new little thing that doesn't talk to anyone else. <laughs> <laughs> so I just realized it after I got yeah. your email. I was yeah. like, oh man, and even within Constant Contact, it's not talking yeah. to different features. So yeah, that's yeah, where yeah. A depressingly about. large number of the content management systems that people use for schools, for sports, for uh, you know a wide variety of things. A depressing number of them make their own. HTML web pages out of some database, right? And there is no standard applied to it, and there is no way to aggregate the information. Um, and it is, you know, and, and it's a problem from two perspectives, right? One is, you know, why don't the people who make these systems have the foresight to provide that? But on the other hand, since no one's asking them, 
right? They don't see it as a priority, right? So it, this, and this is part of what I'm getting to about this is, you know, this has got to be a sort of a, a broader educational kind of thing, right? People, you know, people have to have some sense of, you know, there's data here and we need to be able to use it as data, right? And, you know, I'm not going to buy your solution if it doesn't do this because it won't enable me to do these things. And they, so they're not hearing that right now from people, right? Um, I, you know, I, I went to the Keene School Board and they assured me that the new content, it's always like the new content management system is always going to solve everything, right? And, and so I made them promise that the new content management system was going to support iCalendar and then, um, you know, they bought it and it doesn't. And I called up the company and um, the guy said, like, what's iCalendar? And I said, well, it's the internet standard, for <laughs> you know, right? Uh, you know, so, um, but again, right, I mean, it, oh, okay, okay, so, so I think we're actually, oh, okay, so this is my rant about Keene High School, right? So I, I actually uh, had this conversation with them and I said, you know, to the principal, actually, I said, like, Alan, you know, uh, it just kills me that I can't find out what's going on to the, at the school. And he said, well, this is actually what he said. We posted weekly.pdf to the website. Isn't that good enough? Right? And, you know, this is, this is weekly.pdf, right? And it's like, well, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> right? And so here's the deal, right? I, I, I've sort of, I'm trying to lay this out. Um, this, is the, this is the thing that you see as a human being when... Um, the Keene High School publishes its calendar as a PDF, right? If you're a computer and you open up that PDF file, this is what you see, right? You do not see any structure. And you don't even have to know anything about XML or anything else. You just have to look at it and go, okay, that thing didn't like specify where the dates and times were, right? It's just text like a human would read. It's not anything a machine could deal with, right? Um, so, uh, okay, so in this case, this is uh, uh, how the same events would look in Google Calendar, right? So in this case, you know, what the human being sees is this HTML thing. You can click and interact with it, right? Um, but what the computer sees is this, right? So this is also not a way to convey the data to a computer, right? Um, and this is what computers need to see. So this is how it would look. So if you export the iCalendar feed from Google Calendar, actually you don't ha even have to export it because it just exists at a URL. It's already, if you make a Google Calendar, the iCalendar feed already exists as a transformation of the URL that points here, right? So anyone can use it if you have one, if they know about it, which most people don't. Um, and, or, you know, it could look like this too, right? So there is a proposal to make a different calendar standard that would use XML instead of iCalendar, right? Wouldn't matter at all, right? These things in my book are, are completely equivalent, right? And, and, and equally valuable for this purpose. Um, uh, and, and these things are valuable for different purposes, right? And um, nobody, effectively nobody knows that. That's what we need to, that's one of the things we need to deal with. So, you know, there isn't an app for that, right? There isn't. Um, we, gotta, we gotta get down to what, what's going on here that, that people don't understand. And, need to know and how can we teach that? There was a big, a few years ago, trying to get um, universal profiles because everybody was tired of going from MySpace to Friendster to Facebook. I forgot what that was called, but people were like, why do I have to keep filling this stuff out even for dating sites? Right. So I think in some sense it'll catch on when people see a benefit. They don't have to do anything about data structure in a sense. Someone just has to say, I like your calendar better, how'd you do it? And then it starts, they find people to make it happen. That's part of it. Part, I mean, it's not the part of thing. it. But it seems like the. But you know, this has been, this thing with the Keen PDF file has been going on for five years. And if I can't make any headway, right, um, you know, there's something more going on than that, right? Yeah. It's, um, yeah. you know. It's also got to be the right technology at the right time, and maybe the. See, I, it's not technology. It's not technology, right? It's not technology. It's not applications. It's not services. It's not any of that stuff. And this is this is where we fall down, right? We want it from as as tech geek types. We want it to be about the tools. We want it to be about the applications, right? We want it to be about that mysterious stuff that only we can, you know, teach people, right? It actually isn't, you know. I mean, the stuff that I do doesn't doesn't isn't specific to any application or system, 
right? It's really about, like, if you understand the principle here, then you will find ways to apply it, right? And where you see other people not applying it, you will hold their feet to the fire and say, you are not applying this principle, right? And this is the result of it, right? I can't figure out, I can't figure out how to keep my kid's soccer appointment and my dentist appointment together, along with everything else that's going on, right? And you know what? That's just not OK. Any other last questions? Well, I hope you guys all have the manifesto now whenever you have the opportunity to request calendar data to, to say, hey, how are you publicizing that data? Can I get a feed from it?